I'm Zivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for updates on podcast guests and lots of live events. Today's episode has been sponsored by Good Pods. It's a really amazing app where you can follow your smartest, funniest, most curious podcast junkie friends and other people you admire to see what podcasts they're listening to, and it's all by episode. So I know I have my own podcast, but even I find myself overwhelmed by how many episodes there are of other podcasts and what I should listen to next. So Good Pods is still in beta, and they're looking for testers who will give them honest feedback. So you can go to Good Pods on the App Store or Google Play and check out which podcast your friends are listening to. And by the way, go on there and show them that you're listening to my podcast. That would really be awesome. So anyway, Good Pods was founded by a friend I used to work with many moons ago in, I guess, 1999, which really ages me here. But anyway, JJ Ramberg and I used to work together at a big company called Idealab. If anybody heard of that, she was with a site called cooking.com and I was with Idealab. And now she started Good Pods, among many other endeavors that she's done. Um, and this she's done with her brother, Brad Ramberg, who was also at Idealab with me. So all comes full circle. So anyway, thank you to JJ and Brad and everybody uh, at Good Pods for sponsoring this episode and for making a new searchable listening tracking thing for podcasts, which is going to be super helpful in helping people find great podcasts, hopefully like mine. (laughs) Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here today with Kathleen West, who is the debut author of Minor Dramas and Other Catastrophes. She's a middle and high school teacher and a lifelong Minnesotan, which I don't think I've ever said before. She holds an English degree from McAllister College and a master's degree in literary education from the University of Minnesota. She currently lives in Minneapolis with her husband and two sons. Welcome, Kathleen. Thanks for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Congratulations. Minor Dramas and Other Catastrophes is your first novel. So yes, exciting. It is. It's so exciting. I'm really happy about it. Can you please tell listeners what it's about? Absolutely. Well, I wrote this book about that impulse that I have as a mom and that many moms that I know have to step in and take care of the problems in their kids' lives. And the scenario in this book involves a helicopter theater mom who has lost her sense of boundaries, a progressive English teacher who comes under fire for her curriculum, and a social media scandal that ensnares them both. What inspired you to write this? Did anything like this happen to you? <laughs> well, to I, your students? I have been a teacher for 20 years in Minneapolis, all at elite suburban schools and independent schools. So I've thought a lot about parenting in my life. This scenario did not happen to me. However, my uh, oldest son, who's a 10th grader now, but was a sixth grader when I started writing this book, tried out for a musical called Ellis Island, which is the same musical yeah. in the novel. And as he was trying out, I was very excited and wanted him to get a part. And I definitely had to check my Julia Abbott impulses during that process. I thought, oh, I'll just go down and ask the drama teacher like how that read through went or see if he remembered his choreography. And every time I was like, that would be a bad idea. Like that would be crossing a line. So the day that the cast list came out for the sixth grade Ellis Island that my son had tried out for, my teaching neighbor asked me, like, are you going to go down and look at it and see if he was cast? And once again, like, we laughed about this, and it seemed like it might just be harmless, but we both knew that it would be crossing a line. So then we had a fun time imagining all the moms that would do it, would come into the school and push the kids aside and look at the list. And that's what Julia Abbott does at the beginning of the book. And so that was the first scene that kind of came to me. But you were already in the school. Like you were already teaching. Yes, I worked there. I feel like that wouldn't be so bad. (laughs) Maybe not, but I just think like an adult in the space with the kids, um, like the, the results of the middle school play audition should probably be processed by the middle schoolers first, I think. Okay, yeah. you're probably right. <laughs> I think you know where I'm skewing on yeah, the parenting yeah. uh, spectrum here. I don't want to reveal my helicoptering too much. but So it became the scene of total yes. humiliation because Julia Abbott, while she's like peeking at the, at the cast list, accidentally ends up elbowing one of the students and it's caught on camera and, and social media and goes viral and all the rest of it. Yes. And so she's not as mortified perhaps as she should be, but, you know, it she becomes the whole, right. becomes she the whole thing. And, of course, her kids are, like, 
beside themselves. She thinks it will be just like a minor thing. And then the way that it looks on the video is is extreme. And it kind of is indicative of the attitude that she has had in her parenting for a while. And so I think her community really latches onto that incident and, and blows it up in a way to kind of highlight other ways that she might have overstepped in previous years. So how do you know where the line is? I think that's a great question. And I think parents have to really consider that. And it gets really blurry, especially because things can tend to spiral. Like you hear, oh, my, you know, five of my friends are doing this kind of tutoring. This must be the thing that I should do. Or all of these parents that I've heard of emailed the school about X. And so I should also email the school about X. And I think in society, to be seen as a good parent, people expect you to be constantly advocating for your children. And so you want to be seen as a good parent. I think what I try to remember for myself is that dealing with rejection and failure and disappointment, those are really normal life experiences. And if I can let my kids have those experiences and recover from them and bounce back in a normal kid way, that will serve them better in the long run. So in terms of like a hard line, I don't think there is a hard line, but I try to just evaluate every parenting situation that I have like each one at a time. Like what would be the best thing for my kid in this situation? And what would be my best best thing in this situation? And what would be the consequences of letting them just feel the pain of failing a test versus asking for the retake, et cetera. What do you think the role is of the school? Because I know in this, you're the teacher, but you're also the parent of your own life. And one of the characters obviously is a teacher and one is a parent. Mm -hmm. The school and even the headmaster gets involved, right? Mm -hmm. And different people are influenced in different ways about the casting. And what should the school do, especially when they feel that parents are encroaching on the territory? And maybe particularly donor parents encroaching on the territory. Yeah, I think it's really challenging for school administrators to maintain their values or maintain the school's mission statement, especially when you're working in an independent school. The school in minor dramas is a public school, but I've also worked in independent schools where you're tuition driven and these families are investing a lot of their financial resources in the school and they feel entitled to a certain experience because of that. I think what happens a lot of time is that the teachers and the administrators have one idea of what's best for the kids and the parents have a different idea and they both care super intensely. And that's where the conflict comes up. But in terms of what a school should do, I think that it's really important for a school to have a clear mission statement and a clear set of policies and then to kind of gently coach parents about how they think each situation might be best handled But, I mean, I think it's natural to have disagreement around that kind of thing. I feel like there should be, you know how a lot of schools have, well, at least some of the schools, some of the many schools my kids go to, we have to sign something about the behavior of the kids. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't often address the behavior of the parents and how involved they should be. And I feel like maybe schools should, you know, snip it in the bud by... Yeah. My last school has that, a document that is just like, it's called, I don't remember what the official title of the document is, but it says like a protocol or a chain of communication. And it has a list of what the teachers are expecting expected to do as well. So like what a parent can expect from a teacher and then what a teacher can expect from a parent. And I think having a document like that can really help both sides. So tell me more about the writing of this book. Also, I want to know what your students think about this book and and your community. Are they like rallying behind you and getting totally fired up that one of their teachers? Yes. Yes, I would would think so. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that. Okay, so I, I wrote this book. I'm 41 now, and I started thinking about writing a book about five years ago. And before that, I had just kind of cruised through my life. You know, I I'd wanted to be a teacher. I became a teacher right out of college. I got married and had two children. And then all of a sudden, I was in my late 30s, and I hadn't written that book yet. So it kind of started as a New Year's resolution. I thought, this is the year I will reclaim my writer identity and I will practice writing a book. And that first year, I worked on a totally different story that was a multi-generational family saga. Really not good and (laughs) highly autobiographical in probably some inappropriate ways. So that went back in. That sounds really good to me. (laughs) I just think I wasn't the right writer for that at the time. I've read some great multi-generational family sagas and mine was not one of those. (laughs) So then I had that spark of an idea around the sixth grade musical and that project went away and this project was born. But to make time to write, you know, with my full-time job and my 
kids, that just became a really early morning endeavor. So my writing time was 4.45 to 6.15. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So you was, what time would the alarm go off? 4.30? 4.42. And then I would roll out of bed. Wow. And I start writing right away. There's not even time for coffee. I think I probably started typing around 4.51 or something wow. like that. So, and that, I did that weekdays for three years. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. What time do you go to bed at night? I mean, between nine and 10, probably. So not very late. Other writers I know are night people and they can stay up like after their children and do it then. But that just wasn't my way. So writing the book was great. And when I worked on it, I talked about it with my students a lot. And I think it added a sense of authenticity to my teaching and my writer's workshops with my kids. And I would put little segments that I was working on like into my mini lesson and talk about how I had revised that part or what my goal was for that part. And it was great for me, too, as a writer, thinking about how stressful the publishing process can be because the kids would say, well, are you going to are we going to be able to get this in a bookstore? Are you going to get it published? And I would be able to tell them, you know, I can't control that. I don't know. You know, that's not really the point of writing the book. The point of writing the book is to see if I can do it and to work on my skills as a writer. And so having to talk them through that reminded me of that as well. So it was great. Now my community, like, my teaching community, they were very excited when I announced that the book was going to be published. And then when I told them about the plot of the book, many families said like, oh no, you wrote a book about me. <laughs> but I feel really good about the arc of the characters in the book and the helicopter mom in the book. And it's not based on any one real person. I would never want any parents to think that I had, you know, skewered them in the book. It had always been my goal to be a teacher and it's been such an honor to be part of these families' lives. So I want people to feel good about themselves when they're reading it. Wow. I would think that was so neat if one of my teachers had a book. Yeah, around. they've all been really excited, excited. And some of the students that I had even closer to the beginning of my career have reached out, and that's been really fun and rewarding too. And how did it work with getting it published, getting an agent? You know, it wasn't as, that part wasn't as hard as some of the stories that I've heard. And I think there are a few factors about that. Like, I think... I waited a long time in my writing life to try to pursue publication. So I think my skills had grown. I also approached it with a real detachment. I kind of thought, well, I'm, I'm going to try to get an agent. I probably won't get an agent. So I didn't feel like I was hanging on so, so tight. And I think that kind of helped me. And then also the timeliness of the subject matter of the book, I think, really helped. Mm -hmm. You can't predict what's going to happen. You can't predict that, you know, Felicity Huffman will pay thousands of dollars to get her kid into college. But I think having parenting in the zeitgeist is like really helpful to the book now. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You must have been so happy. Like, I was, her, I like oh, look at this. This is perfect. I but, felt bad, of yeah, course. I know, right? I know, I know. I know. I was, <laughs> <laughs> you had a funny post from your blog, which you've kept yeah, forever. forever. I had yes. so much fun like peeking through the different years. But, so this is from November 2006. Oh, wow. Yeah. You said the first of, this is about parent-teacher conferences. You wrote the first of the conferences with the SOFs, sophomores, I'm assuming, parents. Yeah. Sophomores, parents were pretty fun, except for the one where the mom questioned my qualifications, my assignments, my judgment, my choice of reading material and my ability to connect with kids all the while pounding on the table yes. and chanting, he does not get B pluses. It's true. I could have lived without that one. Yes. I can't believe you found that in there. I remember that conference. Did that really happen? Oh yes. 100% that happened. And that was the same mom. <laughs> I mean, she was very upset. Later that spring, she, I had a great year with that kid and he really enjoyed the class. We had a super good relationship. And I think she ended up feeling sort of sheepish about that conference towards the end of the year. And she ended up writing me a note at the end. And so things turned out okay. But things happen like that all the time in teaching. And those are the things you remember. So it's probably one out of 100 conferences that's like that, or maybe five, but not more than five out of 100. But those are the ones like still 15 years later, like I could recount yeah. the entire thing. Wow. Yeah. And then I stood up for what you're supposed to do if you are in a conference like that. And for that conference, I was at a high school. So I had a line in front of my table and you're supposed to do like your two minute conference. It's super short. And if it goes wrong, you're supposed to kind of stand up and say, it's obvious we're going to need more time. Like let's reschedule. But she came around the back of the table when I said that and kind of was in my space. And after I finished you know, I got her to leave my area. I actually had to tell my line to wait and I had to go to the bathroom, like compose myself and come back. So that one was pretty dramatic. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, it's so funny because 
I feel like so many teachers, and maybe I'm just speaking for you, go into teaching for the love of kids and for love sure. of education, and yet you have so much parent management as part of your job. I think even one of my kids' schools, they have to take a whole day off so the teachers can write the reports to send to the yes. parents, like for report writing day. Yes, we like, have that too. I don't even, do I care that much about these reports? I mm-hmm. kind of know my kids. Like, right. <laughs> give me the like five minute rundown and let's all save that whole day, you know? Yeah. I didn't imagine that parent management would be part of my job. Like I I decided to be a teacher when I was 11 years old. It was really what I wanted to do. I even saved like all the handouts from my English teachers like going through high school in a little filing cabinet labeled wow. by a book title. I didn't use that stuff obviously when I got into the field, but it didn't occur to me at all that parents would be a major part of my job until I actually started in the classroom. And I mean, like I said before, I think I can understand it, especially after my own kids were born. Then I had this kind of empathy infusion of what was really going on when they were calling me and this overwhelming love and fear for my children. So I do get it, but it's not my favorite part. And you're also a huge reader. So you have a huge Goodreads following. You're always coming up with your favorite books and lists and things like that. Yeah, I enjoy that. tell me about your love of reading and what types of books you like the most. Oh, that's a great question. Well, I was a super voracious reader as a kid. And then in those busy years of having my job and my kids and blah, 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 I kind of lost that reader identity. And the year before I had my New Year's resolution to reclaim my writer identity. I had my 52 books a year New Year's resolution, which I've continued on through the years. You need to like send me your New Year's resolutions. (laughs) Well, that one is always the same thing. I I mean, like next January, just send me an email about whatever year is what I'm going to do. Okay. So I, you know, when I was teaching this year, I'm not teaching for the first time in a long time, but I read a lot of middle grade and young adult books because of my job. So that's a really favorite category of mine. I read a lot of so-called women's fiction, like my own book. You know, I read pretty widely. I try to make sure that I have a balance of nonfiction and fiction. I try to read literary fiction and thrillers and mysteries. I like that. There's not too many genres that I don't, that I'm not interested in. I, I would say that I don't read a lot of historical fiction. I'm not a huge reader of that genre, but I will. If there's a book that everybody is talking about, then usually I want to be a part of it. (laughs) So I'll read it. And when do you find the time to read? I read every night before bed and it does really motivate me. Now I'm revealing a little bit of my personality, like the New Year's resolution. Like if I say I'm going to do it, then I will do it. So I'm behind right now. Like I'm a book behind on my book a week. So I know that in the back of my head. And so that might make me change my plans a little bit. Like I might turn off The Bachelor or something before the rose ceremony and catch up the next day so that I have time to read a few more pages before bed. But I just put it into little spaces if I'm waiting for my kids at their sports practices or whatever. Yeah. that's like I do audiobooks too. That really helps. And those count for me in my total. Of course they count. Yes, I love them, so... I mean, they're the same books oftentimes yeah. or, or new great books. Yeah. That's great. So when you were writing, is it always like in the same, do you have like a ritual? It sounds like you're very programmed. So yeah. During these morning periods, mm-hmm. desk, kitchen table. No, couch. couch. There's a couch. I, my kitchen and I have like a family room that's attached to the kitchen. So that was be where I sat. And I had this, I have a little blanket that's made out of sleeping bag material. This is a lot of detail about it. I like it. (laughs) And I just kind of roll out of bed in my pajamas and usually put on a sweatshirt, sit on in the same place on that couch with my blanket. And when I first started, I had a 400 word quota. Like I had to get that done within that time. And if I didn't, then I would have to find another time to get like the four, up to 400. So during recess or something at school or you know, whatever, a spare moment. I needed to get it in. And then once I'd practiced for a while, 400 became pretty easy to accomplish. So then I would up it to 600 or whatever as I went. But it is kind of a relief now. This year I'm writing full-time, so it's a relief not to have to do that or have that kind of like very strict mentality, like word count and minutes and all of that. I can I have a little more flexibility, which is really nice. And what are you working on now? Well, I just turned in a draft of my next book and I'm pretty excited about it. The I think I've been telling people the big difference is about the kids. I love writing about 
kids and teenagers. And in minor dramas, I have two teenagers that are point of view characters and they are really perfect. They do everything right. They have their own values, you know, fully formed personalities, great people. It's their parents that are making all the mistakes and their teachers that are making the mistakes. And in my second book, I really started to think about what happens when the kids make mistakes and how those mistakes impact parents' reputations. That's something I've been thinking about a lot. Like if you get your kid's report card and it's all A's or something, you feel like you've earned some mother of the year points. Like, oh, I must have done a great job this semester. Or if your kid's hockey team wins their game, then people tell you congratulations. And I wish as a mom and as a teacher that we could separate ourselves a little bit more from our kids' identities and our kids' failures and accomplishments. So in the second book, I have kids making big mistakes and parents thinking about how that impacts their relationships and their reputations. Interesting. Yeah. Do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Yes. I think that you should just do it. Like if people tell me, oh, I think I'd like to write a book, my advice is just just start it. <laughs> just start it and just keep writing it even if it's terrible. That's my thing. Like it, I still do have like a word count in mind for the day. I don't have to do it within a really short period of time anymore. But if I just give myself permission to write something terrible then I can usually get through it. And it's so much easier to fix something terrible than it is to start fresh. So just write down the bad stuff. Do you have a clue of what your next New Year's resolution is going to be? Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to think. I'll still have my 52 books. Uh, that one has been in every year. This year, instead of setting a specific goal for 2020, my goal, like with the book coming out and with so many things I can't control with the book coming mm -hmm. out, yep. like I, I just can't tell you, you know, I can't set a goal of X number of people to buy the book, for instance. I can't make that happen. So I told myself my resolution this year was to take one thing at a time. It's kind of an anti-resolution or it's not really like me, but that's what I'm doing. But you need it. I need it. Yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming thank on the show. Thank you for having me. This uh, is so fun to fun. chat with you about this. Yeah. Congratulations thanks. again. Thank you. You've been listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books with Zibby Owens. Please make sure to sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com to get more updates about episodes like these and also lots of live events. Thanks again to Good Pods for sponsoring this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. You can follow me on Instagram at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. 